So first of all, Rebecca, I want to welcome you and thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank I- you. I'm so excited to be here with you. Well, I've been eager to have you on. You have so many exciting things to talk about on your podcast, which I love, Tudor's Dynasty for everyone. Um, Please be sure and be listening if you're not already. You should be already. So I would like to talk to you a little bit about one of the families, and I know you know a lot about this family, who seems to me to be throughout the Tudor's Dynasty one step from the center of power and they're just it's just like they're almost there and then they fall away or someone (laughs) betrays someone or someone gets beheaded or you know but there's and this is the famous Howard family so what can you tell us about this marvelous family that threads its way all through the Tudor dynasty and all of the monarchs and all of the intrigue and some of the fun, fascinating family feuding and family drama relating to that family. You know, the Howards were one of those families who knew how to marry well. You know, there were so many of those families at court that just made these great arrangements. And I feel like when it comes to the Tudor dynasty, that's why we know the Howard family so well is because the drama surrounding their immediate family was so fantastic. Yeah, that's a great point. Knowing how to marry well is just really important at that time. Right. And, you know, here we have Thomas Howard, the third Duke of Norfolk. Well, he's not yet the third Duke of Norfolk. He's the Earl of Surrey because his father is still alive. And his first wife passes away and he needs to find a second bride. And um, who better than to join forces with but the, the Duke of Buckingham? Mm-hmm. I mean, you have the Norfolk and the Buckinghams. Holy cow, like that is quite the alliance. So, you know, the two fathers are, are working together trying to make this great alliance. And um, initially, Elizabeth Stafford's father, you know, offers up her sister and the Duke of Norfolk, well, I guess Thomas Howard, who we now know, know as the Duke of Norfolk, um, wanted Elizabeth because she was the eldest daughter. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he knew that she was going to end up getting the most money. Right, right. Which was the, which is part of the key, right? Who's going to get the most money? Yeah, exactly. Well, here's the problem. The problem starts with the fact that Elizabeth was supposed to marry somebody else. And so this whole time, she is imagining her life with this other guy. She originally was supposed to marry Ralph Neville, who was the soon-to-be fourth Earl of Westmoreland. And this marriage was starting to come together. She, you know, she says in a letter later that um, she and Ralph had loved together for two years and that it was her plan to marry him before Christmas. But then... Her father and Thomas Howard made other arrangements, and then she was planned to marry Norfolk instead. So could you imagine this poor girl, like so many other Tudor women? Right, right. Expected this love match, and then it turned out otherwise. Right. And that it's so rare to have any opportunity for a love match. So if you think you found one, and you're going to be one of the few... That must have been just devastating to just have that ripped away. Well, right. And the the weird thing is, is that she even when they got married, she was only 15 and he was 35. And it really does appear that they had a decent relationship at the beginning. Um, You know, she moved to Ireland with him in 1520 with the kids so that he could serve as the lieutenant of Ireland. Right. But the following year, her father is executed for treason. Uh Aha. See, that's the thing with these Howards. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then it's only a few years year a few years later, like fifteen twenty seven, when Thomas Howard took a mistress, and of course we know the very well um, Bess Holland uh, became his mistress, and she was actually one of Anne Boleyn's attendants, which is probably kind of where he ran into her, maybe at court. Right. Yes. So, of course, Elizabeth is a proud Stafford. 
and she's not very happy about this and she kind of you know lashes out about it she calls best names well norfolk doesn't want to deal with it basically and he sends her away and he lets you know Bess run the ruse for you know so to speak well the the thing that's interesting to me is there's some similarities you know between father and child in the respect that his daughter Mary, so he had two daughters and a son. So there was an older daughter, her name was Catherine. And she was married to um the the heir to the, the Earl of Derby. I think he was I don't think he was exact I don't think he was the Earl of Derby yet. But she was married to the Earl of Derby. Now another great marriage alliance for the Howard family. But soon after, she died from the plague. Now, of course, Norfolk's thinking, okay, we're connected to the Earl of Derby. We really need to keep this alliance going. So he starts working on a marriage for his daughter, Mary. Now, all while this is going on, he's still feuding with his wife, but he's working out how to make these other alliances. And so I'm sure at this point, Mary's beginning to think, hey, I'm going to marry my sister's husband. Uh-huh, uh-huh, step right into those shoes. Right. But then Anne Boleyn enters the picture. So we're at the time when she's at her height. She's about to become queen. And she is working behind the scenes um, to make a marriage alliance between her cousin, Mary Howard, Um, and the king's illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy. Well, and then, you know, then we take into account the fact that when the betrothal was all put together, that um, Mary didn't have to worry about a a dowry at all, that she could come to this marriage with nothing, essentially. I think that's interesting, too. So Mary comes completely without a dowry. Yeah. And it's interesting because she comes without a a dowry, but she's guaranteed a jointure um, that will give her a thousand marks per year. So she comes into this situation without having to bring any money. Her dad's off the hook. Yeah. And she's going to get paid money if anything happens because the family agreed on this financial situation. Okay. So it's a financial situation that benefits her just flat out on paper. Okay. Yeah. So it, it kind of protects her then if something were to happen. Okay. Now, we have them getting married in 1533, so same same year of the coronation of Anne Boleyn, right? Right. And then in 1536, after, you know, Anne Boleyn, of course, was executed on the 19th of May, mm-hmm. um, just a month or two later, Henry Fitzroy dies unexpectedly. Right. Yes. And we don't, we don't know for sure what he died from. There's speculation that it was tuberculosis or other things, but we don't really know for sure what he died from. Well, Mary is a widow and, um, you know, she's not very old. She's probably like 15, maybe 16 years old at the time. Okay. And she's got this jointure that she's supposed to get, but the king doesn't want to give it to her. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. He says, hang on a second. You know, you guys were too young. The marriage wasn't consummated. I don't really owe you anything. And and so her father, the Duke of Norfolk, begins to fight. So he consults with some people and finds out that, yes, his daughter should be given this money. But he's in kind of a precarious situation, too, because he doesn't want to upset the king. And right. lose over. Well, in the meantime, his daughter Mary is upset because she's like, where's my money, dad? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting for my money. And he's like, hold on, daughter. I'm working on this. And she's being, you know, she's impatient. Maybe she doesn't really even know what he's all doing behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, but she decides that she needs to take matters into her own hands at some point. And she keeps, you know, she tells her father um, that she's consulted with her own counsel and she kind of starts emotionally blackmailing him to fight harder for her. And this is about the time that Norfolk writes a letter to Cromwell. And this is one of my favorite letters. And I'm going to try to read it to you. And I'm sorry if I slaughter it, but. Oh, that's great. He writes, in all my life, I've never communed with her in any serious cause ere now, and would not have thought that she had been such as I find her, which, as I think, is but too wise for a woman. I love that phrase. (laughs) I love it so much. (laughs) So he's like, my daughter is a lot smarter than I thought she was. (laughs) (laughs) Who would have thought a woman could be so wise? 
Mm -hmm. Right. So now he's dealing with that and she's pushing, you know, I want to go to court, dad, let me go to court and fight for this because you're not doing it for me. And eventually Norfolk says, okay, you can go to court, but little does Mary know that she's, she's going to a setup basically. So she goes to court and this is in 1538 now. Okay. And okay. she finds out she's really there because they want to arrange this marriage betrothal between her and Thomas Seymour. So behind the scenes, Norfolk is working with Cromwell and the Seymours to arrange this marriage because it, it, it benefits everybody. Okay. All right. So bring in the Seymours to this story. So this is, this is in, you said 1538. Yeah. So yeah. I know Jane Seymour sadly has passed away by this time, but what are the Seymour brothers doing in 1538? <laughs> Well, um, at this point, um, let's see, Edward Seymour is the Earl of Hartford mm -hmm. and Thomas Seymour was knighted, um, at his nephew's baptism. So you have an Earl and you have a knight, but they're both of course, uncles to the future King of England. So right from a powerful family in a sense. And for some reason, nothing, you know, nothing, um, becomes of this this idea of this marriage between mary and thomas not really sure what happened okay i don't know if she had enough power to say no at that point um but it helped to trigger something because it wasn't long after that that she began receiving some money from the king okay so from the jointure so she is beginning to get paid some yeah. of that okay she, she must have stood her ground and said, no, <laughs> I'm not marrying him because it's going to make your life easier, dad, or the king or whoever, you know, I'm going to say no and stand my ground. And they start paying her. And by 1540, she became, she began receiving a generous income. So she had kind of um, finally won for the most part. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah. So I I love that, you know, she fought for that. But then it's funny to me, again, in 1546, um, her father tries another marriage agreement with Thomas Seymour. So at this time, you know, it was like June 1546. I'm sure Henry VIII's health probably wasn't very good. Right. Um, how Thomas Howard was, you know, still kind of a Catholic and he, the Seymours weren't, so he could probably see the the writing on the wall, what he had to do. Okay. So do you think Norfolk is sort of navigating himself into a favorable position for the next reign? Oh, definitely. So he says, you know, Mary, why don't you marry Thomas? And then they come up with another arrangement where um, some of Edward Seymour's kids and the Earl of Surrey's kids are going to marry each other. So the families are going to be connected for forever. Okay. Okay. Well, the problem with that is there's a long history of bad blood between Edward Seymour and the Earl of Surrey. They just did not get along. So... Mary's like, hi, you know, I don't really know if I want to marry Thomas Seymour. And she's having a conversation with her brother and the Earl of Surrey um, tells her, well, you know, why don't you hold off? Don't give them an answer yet. And, you know, wait until the king calls you back into his presence again. And she's like, oh, OK. And then he's like, and then keep, you know, keep stalling so that the king can see you more and that you could eventually become his mistress. And of course, Mary took great offense. Oh, to this. wow. She really could have taken this one of two ways. You know, the first way, obviously, she'd be upset, upset with her brother because he hinted at her becoming the king's mistress. But she could have also been disgusted by it because the king essentially was her father because she was married to his son. So it would have been like marrying her father. So she could have been mad at Surrey or she'd just been disgusted by the action. <laughs> okay. By him saying that. Yeah. In in all ways of looking at it, this is just really the kind of advice you don't expect to be getting from your brother. No, no. And, and she yells at him and she was like, you know, that she would cut her own throat rather than she should consent to such villainy. Great. I yeah. Love her. Yeah. Again, she's awfully wise for a woman there standing up for herself. Yeah. And that's why I, she's fantastic. 
Do you have a sense, because I know you know a lot about Thomas Seymour, of how he felt about this possible opportunity to wed Mary Howard and join that family? You know, there is nothing to indicate how he felt about it. Okay. And it's interesting because I think back to, you know, 1538, we're not even talking about Catherine Parr yet. So that wasn't until 1542, probably at the earliest that anything was, you know, discussed between them. Right. So he was young. I mean, he was young enough. He was probably about 30 at this time. Yeah. I can't see why he would have been opposed to the marriage, you know, to join up with the Howard family would have been great. Right. Right. So, yeah. There's just nothing in the records that tell us concretely how he felt. I'm just going off of what I've learned about him. And then when we look again at the 1546 one, that's the one mm -hmm. that interests me the most because, you know, he wanted to marry Catherine Parr before the king did. So that was 1543. Okay. And 1546, of course, she was still married to the king. Right. Maybe they thought he would live a lot longer. I just, I don't, I don't know how they could think that, but. <laughs> right. Right. But well, I think they you were legally required to think that. <laughs> this is true. Or you would lose your head. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that one's really interesting to me because, you know, yes. in order to talk about this, it was a family affair. So I'm sure Edward Seymour was involved in this and I'm sure Thomas was involved in it. So I can't foresee it happening if he wasn't interested in it okay i just don't right. know that anybody could force thomas to do anything right <laughs> yes yes and you know that but it you do wonder at that stage of his life where it doesn't seem like Catherine parr is going to be immediately available um why he wouldn't be seeking a, a an advantageous marriage right that would um, help, you know, position him more close to the seat of power. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, so it is really intriguing. Yeah. Uh, there's one, um, one interesting little tidbit to add to that, too, is that in her testimony, Kat Ashley also says that um, Thomas would have wished to wed the Lady Elizabeth before Henry VIII died. So then he would have been connected to both Mary Fitzroy and Elizabeth. Oh, possibly okay. In 46. So it seems like he was looking. So you would say Thomas was looking for a marriage, but Mary was not. So why might that be? That's so often Well, happens. you know, she, she was the daughter of Elizabeth Stafford, who mm -hmm. was thought to be little haughty you know mm -hmm. you think mary probably was likely much like her mother in that respect where she probably thought hey i have this income coming in what do i need a husband for yeah and she was smart yeah yeah well and maybe that's part of that wise for a woman and she's just going to be fine by herself then both father and son norfolk and surrey fall afoul of the law and the long arm of henry the eighth Without going into detail about how they managed to make the king angry, let's talk about how the women respond. It's fascinating that in this so-called age of men, the mistress, the daughter, and even the wife who has been sent away end up being able to call some of the shots. Tell us about that. So you have Mary and you have um, your father's mistress, Beth Holland. The two of them, you know, gave testimony against Norfolk and Surrey. And it's crazy to me that the, in the end, there were these these three women, I guess, if you include Elizabeth Stafford, you know, these three women standing at the end. Well, we have a daughter, a mistress and a wife. And we might expect those to be the ones who get caught up in the wheel of fortune as it's spinning around. But that doesn't turn out to be the case in this story. And you never know which way the wheel of fate is going to turn because yes. you know, in the end, the Earl of Surrey was executed. He was beheaded and his father was saved because Henry VIII died. Right. And that's one of the details I love about this story. 
because if Henry VIII had died a few days earlier, maybe neither of them would have been executed. Right. If Henry VIII had lived a week longer, they would have both been (laughs) executed. So that idea of teetering on the brink of disaster is just literally down to the day. Yeah. You know, every part of this story is just so interesting. And I am really, really appreciative of you walking us through it. Rebecca, if you were to take away one or two nuggets from the story of Mary Howard and her decisions in her life and and what she did, what are just a couple of things you would like to send people away with? Mm. You can never be too wise for a woman. Yeah, that's just fantastic. (laughs) Right. And always stand up for what you believe is yours. One of the things I love about history is that history shows us what's possible. And this story totally does that. So, Rebecca, thank you so much. I have loved this. I have loved learning more about these figures and this crazy family and these brave and wonderful and outspoken women, my very one of my very favorite things, outspoken women. And I especially have loved you being here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. I'm so happy to have been here. I'm so glad that you invited me because I love talking about this stuff. And it's so nice to be on the other side of the table, so to speak. (laughs) Um, So I want to let everybody know too, that if you're interested in in reading anything about um, the Earl of Surrey, I highly recommend Jesse Child's book, Henry VIII's Last Victim. That's a great book. Okay, I was going to ask for that. So thank you. So Jesse Childs, who has some great stuff out there. And tell us the title one more time. It's Henry VIII's Last Vink. Let me try that again. It's Henry VIII's Last Victim, The Life and Times of Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey. Okay. And I love, I I love her books, but I love that title, Last Victim. I just think that's such a great, you know, and reinforces that idea that, you know, if his death had come two days later, somebody else would have been the last victim. So that's great. That's great. All right. Well, thank you again so much. And everybody, tell everybody where they can find you to learn more about you. Oh, well, you can listen to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast, which is available everywhere, or check out my website, tutorsdynasty.com, where I have all kinds of articles about the Howards, the Seymours, the Boleyns, and everyone else. All right. And be sure and check out the podcast if you're not already listening, because it is a treat every time. So thank you again, Rebecca, and thank you everyone for listening, and we will see you next time.
I'm Rebecca Larson, host of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast, and I am so thrilled to be here on the British History Royals, Rebels, and Romantics podcast with Carol Ann. I love Tudor drama. Yes, <laughs> it just it's the gift that keeps on giving.